Welcome back to Little Wars TV. Today uh, I am joined by Chow, and if you saw our Season 2 finale, you watched us play a uh, Red Baron World War I war game. And today we're going to be talking about the set of rules that we used for that game. This is Wings of Glory, published by Ares Games. And uh, Chow and I are going to give you our thoughts based on five different categories. You can see those on the screen right now. And let's get started with presentation. Okay, as far as presentation, I mean, what can I say? It's an attractive game. It's packaged well. It's designed well. It has a relatively short rulebook. Extremely. <laughs> um, but the uh, the models that are associated with it are, I consider, a fairly high-end product. I mean, I'm sure there's people out there that are repainting them, but... Oh, the paints look great. Yeah, I mean, why? you know, you would do that because you really wanted to, not because you feel like you have to. So, I mean, overall, presentation is... I don't really have many knocks against it. So this is actually a little bit of a weird one for presentation because normally, you know, we're reviewing a set of rules. But this is a set of rules that requires that you also use their miniatures. Mm. So I guess we're including the miniatures as part of the presentation here? Well, I think you have to because because it is, the, the way the components are, the way the mechanics work, is you can't really just bring in your own miniatures. No, you can't because you have to have the cards that go with them, which we'll get to later in the well, review. And what we'll also get to as well is that even though we're saying that you have to have miniatures, you don't have to have a lot of miniatures no. to play a game. Yeah, but no. I mean, you could do like two. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I don't know how you can separate the two at this point. Yeah, the, the rules yeah. are very short. Mm. You can even download the rules as a, a PDF directly from Ares for free online. So the rules aren't exactly a, you know something that you're paying for. What you're really paying for are all the other game components. Like the cards and the counters. Right? Cards, the flight stands, this comes with a little token. So it, and it's all included. And as you said, I think the production value is incredibly high. Yeah. Um, I'm, I am going 9 out of 10. No, I, I think it makes sense. I probably have different reasoning, but I end up in the same number. I also have a 9. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think when I'm, I'm saying 9, it's not the rule book, which is typically what we're reviewing. I know. Reviewing. That's why it's a little but weird. If, if we did that, we'd be done in like 10 seconds. And uh, I don't <laughs> yeah. know what I mean. So, well, okay, so a 9 for both of us then. All right, now we're going to get to our second category, which is playability. This one is 30% of the weighted score, so this is one of the two most important categories. And here, Chal and I are looking at how easy is it to get into a game, uh, how much stuff do you need, how much time do you need to play, and then can you teach new players easily. And honestly, I don't know how it could get a whole lot better than oh. Wings of Glory. I mean, you need a table space that's as small as two feet or three feet square. You need as few miniatures as two. Two. <laughs> We've actually played two plain games of this and it's great, or as many as you want. Mm -hmm. And you can teach anybody. I mean, I've seen at conventions, I've seen kids, you know, kids that are like eight or 10 years old playing this game. So whether you're a kid or an adult, I think it's it's quite easy to teach. So, I mean, what's, what's the knock? What's the problem with the playability in this game? Um, there's really not, uh, I mean, playability, in this case, just the way that presentation is like a question mark, how we did presentation, I think playability drifts over into mechanics because part of the reason it's so easy to play is that card system yeah. that you just lay the cards down and they have a little arrow and it shows you exactly where you end up at. I mean, <laughs> even if you can't even read the language the, the rules are written in, if you see those cards, you'll understand that that's what you're supposed to do. It's, it's, it is extremely easy to play. I think... Um, where I might have a, a little bit on the playability, and it's probably not even fair, is 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 the cards sometimes because there's a little bit of drift with them, mm -hmm. and I know it's maybe more a mechanical issue, is that it sometimes is difficult to get to a specific point. And yeah, especially if your stand overlaps somebody else's yeah, stand. Yeah, and a specific, I'm glad you mentioned that. And that, that happens a lot. <laughs> that's actually what I meant was is right. that the stands, the stands get in each other's way, because the stands are fairly substantial, which they yes. have to be to be able to make sure that the models don't tip over right um, but those particular stands are probably the thing maybe the only thing in the game system I don't particularly like hmm I see uh, well what uh, sounds like you're giving it a relatively high score oh, yeah, are you yeah. on this an eight an eight yeah okay uh, I'm giving it a nine out of ten and the only reason I'm not going ten because I think it's incredibly playable uh, is something we'll get back to in support uh, which is the availability mm -hmm. of some of the models I have a little bit of a complaint there that we'll talk about at the end. Okay, so our third uh, category is mechanics, and I already kind of mentioned this a little bit. 
effectively you are using cards, but they're not random. You're choosing your cards and there are rules about which cards can be played before or other because you're physically moving a plane. If it's diving, then it has to do this or if it's, if it's climbing. Um, but basically the cards are the way that you play the game and then damage shooting, which is obviously a component of, of what we're trying to represent with World War I dogfighting, is also uh, conducted via a card deck. Uh, which in this case, I'm not really always a big fan of random card decks, but I think it actually works really well. It does work well on a practical level, but I'm still not a huge fan of the combat mechanics. If an enemy ends his movement in your arc of fire, you hit him automatically. You draw a random damage card. It's just not the most tactically interesting mechanic by any means. <laughs> well, what I like about it is, is that most of the time you're shooting, you are either not doing damage or you're doing very little damage. And you never know because you don't know what damage you did to your opponent, which I like right. that. The damage cards are all drawn in secret. And in they secret. could have a zero on them. In fact, a lot of the damage a cards lot of them have zero. Have zero. But by using the card system, they're able to work into the deck very specific, very uh, traumatic events without having to use the, what I would say, like the typical, oh, you roll on the crit table. Right. Oh, you rolled a 10. Roll on the crit table. What kind of crit did you get? And then, you know, you roll like five times to get a result. This doesn't do that. They have a big deck of cards, mostly that don't have much damage, and then within them there are, you explode, <laughs> your pilot dies, yeah. you know. And your, all your plane's <laughs> on fire. <laughs> Which is not good. It may sound yeah. like it's okay, but, yeah. but trust me, your plane being on fire is not a good thing in, in any any genre. Um, but but it but it works. I mean, I think it works really well. I, I agree. I think I think it works very well. I, I want to do go back for a second. You know, you mentioned the maneuver cards. Hmm. One of the things I really like about the maneuver cards that you get with each plane is that they are specific yeah. to the plane itself. Yep. And that's one of the reasons that there's a proprietary IP component to this game because in order to play the game, you need to buy their miniatures because their miniatures have the cards associated with that plane. And a plane that's more maneuverable will have a tighter turn radius printed mm -hmm. on the card. A plane that's faster will have a longer straightaway mm -hmm. that you can lay. So it does a nice job of reflecting the differences between the aircraft. And you plot those cards out three at a time. And I, I like the idea that you always have to be thinking ahead in this game. Yeah. You plot your three cards. And as those cards are revealed, you know, your opponent may have veered off to the left and you can't respond right away because you still have two more cards that you plotted yeah. and you guys are often sort of veering away from each other. Right, you expected them to be over there, so you start trying to maneuver your rickety aircraft that <laughs> way. Well, you can't just suddenly sling it back over right. and like, oh, hey, he's going that way. No, this, this is not like some sort of high-performance sports car that turns on a dime. And that's okay. Yeah. And what you do end up with is a lot of times in games where guys are just flying around maneuvering apparently aimlessly as yeah. they try to like line up shots. Yes. Now, I perhaps don't like it so much that occasionally that it happens and I've seen games where you don't have a lot of aircraft that you may go for a couple of turns before somebody can shoot. Right. And you know, I think that's just the price you pay. More experienced players though, that's much less likely to happen. I think it's less likely to happen and I think it's a good reason to run this game on a small table space. Uh, yeah. You know, in, in, in the uh, video that you saw when we played the finale, we were playing this on six by four tables. I mean, honestly, that's because we had a lot of planes. Yeah, a lot but of planes. if you're playing this at home, I think this is a game that works really well on a tight table space because it compacts the area that you could potentially be aimlessly flying in. <laughs> Let's conclude our discussion of the mechanics by saying that if you want to learn to play the game, Ares Games has an incredibly well done video that teaches you how to play in five minutes. It is top-notch. It's probably the best tutorial I've seen in the hobby for any game. Link will be in the description below and also at the end of this review. So, mechanics. Uh, what, kind of, uh, what kind of score did you go with on this well, thing? So I, went, I went with eight. I went with eight. I said I have some minor yeah. complaints, but I mean, eight for me is, I think, a pretty, pretty good score on mechanics because there's nothing wrong. I, I actually found this to be the toughest category to score out of all of them because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really split of two minds on this. On the one hand, I look at it and say this is definitely what we would call a beer and pretzels yeah, game. Yeah, yeah. And for a beer and pretzels game, I think the mechanics are awesome. But if I'm comparing it to the scope of other game options that are available that are maybe a little bit more serious games, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the Check Your Six system for air combat. Oh, yeah. Um, it, it's not necessarily a fair comparison, but they are simulating the same thing. And I think that mechanically there's some much more innovative uh, and clever ideas that are happening in that game as a more serious game than you're getting in this beer and pretzels game. So... Uh, 
I, maybe I'm being unfair, but I ended up giving it a 7. Still a respectable score. Yeah. Alright, our fourth category would be historical flavor. 20% of the score. Uh, when you're playing this game, does it feel like you're in the cockpit of a World War I aircraft? And is it rewarding the use of period-appropriate tactics? Okay, there's some things I think it scores really highly on. Uh, you already mentioned the one you mentioned about the fact that the card decks are specific to the aircraft. So right, right. away, yeah. somebody's trying to do some research. One of the things that I like... For example, it even has for some of the aircraft the way the engine slings, uh. slings it to one side. So your curve radius going one way is better than going the other way yes. because your engine keeps on slinging you that way. That's um, a very subtle little it's nod. Subtle, it's subtle. You know, when you look at that deck and you don't know why, you're like, well, why do I have these really big arcs <laughs> going one way and, and have much tighter arcs going the other way? Well, that's why. Right. Because somebody did some research. Um, for me, though, because it is a beer and pretzels game, you know, I am dinging it a little bit because... Sure. I don't like the feel, it always seems like on this particular review we're jumping back and forth, but I don't like the fact that there are occasions when guys will just be kind of drifting around and it's not even like you're really maneuvering for position, it's just basically like you've kind of accidentally disengaged and I always think, well, how did that happen? You plotted the wrong cards, <laughs> that's how it happened. Wrong. And both of you go flying off in yeah. different directions. Um, there's a part of me that thinks that you would have some opportunity to, to get back on track you know, you don't have to listen to me. What do I know? Uh, but that, that's where I'm at. Okay, yeah. Um, I, th I think the historical flavor is good, not great. I mean, you mentioned the maneuver decks. That's certainly a really nice way to reflect it. We also mentioned the damage deck, and it's worth pointing out that there are different decks depending on which plane you're flying. So a more heavily armed aircraft will pack more punch with the damage cards. That is a nice tip of the hat to historical accuracy, but... The shooting mechanics still just feel a little bit too random for me. Not a huge fan of the basic altitude rules that are included mm. in this, and, and there are some, uh, some rules in here for altitude. We actually, in our game, used a modified set of altitude rules that we thought were an improvement because we also had those telescoping uh, mm, yeah. stands that you saw. The stands that you normally get with this game are just little plastic pegs, and the planes are you know relatively low to the table, but I just have trouble wrapping my head around the idea that in an air combat game, the altitude here is kind of like an afterthought. It was like it was like a little bolt-on, you know, like, uh, in fact, they tell you in the game that it's optional. Like, the altitude rules are sort of an advanced thing. Well, it's an air combat game. What do you mean the altitude rules are an advanced thing? That that should be a an essential component to the game. I will counter you a little bit on the altitude. It's not that you're incorrect. Just far be it for me to tell you that you're wrong. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. But what I would say is that maybe if you come from a mindset you used to, like, say, World War II dogfighting or, in particular, modern era dogfighting, there are certainly altitude differences in World War I dogfighting, but they probably aren't quite as critical. No. I mean... No, not if you're comparing periods. No, no. and, and I, think, I think the altitude is maybe... Yeah, I'm going to get a lot of feedback on this. <laughs> Maybe the altitude isn't as important a factor in the World War I dogfighting because mm -hmm. the inability to change altitude as rapidly as you could see with later aircraft means that with these guys are really widely separated, they may stay separated for a while yes. you know, in altitude, whereas in World War II, you know, you got zero screaming out of the blue right onto the deck. I mean, right. you know, that, that's just not something you saw as much here because the aircraft can't can't withstand it. And not not to that extent, but still, when you're when you're reading historical accounts of this, you know, one of the most popular tactics, particularly by the Red Baron, is you know the classic diving out of the sun. You want the sun behind you and your enemy's face so that you're coming out. He's turning around. He's getting blinded. You don't really ever have the opportunity to do something quite like that in this game. And maybe it is just because it is a beer and pretzels experience. So that, that gets back to that push-pull of which, which way are you going to lean on that. I will say on the subject of historical accuracy that there are a number of advanced and optional rules in the rule booklet that cover uh, some pretty interesting stuff. You know, balloons, incendiary rounds, ace pilots, tailing. Uh, th there's there's a couple cool wrinkles that you can use to, I think, improve some of the historical flavor. I ultimately gave this a, a 6 out of 10. It was my lowest category of all of them. Well, this is actually one of the lowest scores I had on mine was also a 7. You well, know, I thought we were disagreeing here. Well, but... we were disagreeing. We, we, we ended up almost the same place, but for different reasons. No, that's okay. <laughs> 
All right, our final category in this review is going to be support. Uh, what kind of uh, support materials are offered by the publisher, uh, by the fan community? If you're, if you're going to buy a copy of this game, can you go out there on the internet or in person and, and find other players? And I actually think the support for Wings of Glory is outstanding. Uh, I think Ares Games does a really good job. I had already mentioned they make the rules available for free online. So if you just want to read through them and see if it's for you, you, you can do that. Uh, and in addition to what Ares Games puts out there, there is a very active fan community with the Aerodrome website. We'll be sure to put a link to that in the description below. Totally fan-driven and tons of content and material on there. Well, I don't think I can disagree with any of that. Um, I think the support is is is, is good. Uh, you know, I don't think I have anything to add. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, let me get to my criticism. Then. Okay, go ahead. Because I alluded earlier in the review that I did have a criticism under playability, and it's going to also come home to roost here for support. Ares Games doesn't always do a great job of having all mm. the planes and all the materials in stock. There are tons of different uh, planes for this, which is great. So I'm sure it's like a nightmare from a manufacturing and fulfillment standpoint. Yeah. But part of that nightmare is as a consumer, you can't always buy what you want. And that is also true on their game mats, because in addition to the planes, they sell other accessories. And when you saw us playing the game in our video, you saw that we were actually using one of the Ares Games mats. It's like a mouse pad material. Yeah. I mean, they're... They're really nice. It's, it's, a, it's a great yeah, it's, mat. It's not like a felt or anything like that. Like you said, mouse pad. The, the thing about the game mat is that the mat that we've really wanted most of all is called No Man's Land. And it's been out of stock for at least a year. Oof. So, I mean, that's just like <laughs> one example of, of one of the issues that you have to deal with. Luckily, the, the, the core box set is always available. And most of the planes are. So, maybe I'm being overly critical, but well, I feel like you should be able to buy all the products all the time. And I, I don't think we mentioned this before, but one of the reasons why the planes, um, it's important, is that because if you have a model of a plane, there's variants to the model of the plane. Right. But yeah. then there are also specific flyers of that specific variant. Right. So, like you mentioned Rick Tobin, I mean, he's got his own aircraft. Right. right. So you could get a generic DR1, yes. or you can get, you the, get Richtofen. And guess which one you probably would prefer. Yeah, um, right. But but it's not just that. There 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 are, there are quite a few uh, historical historical flyers are represented uh, from all the all the major yes. all the major powers. Definitely. So so something being out is actually an issue because you may specifically want Richtofen. Um, I don't want to sound like you know I'm being overly critical. I actually still gave it an eight out of ten. I gave it a, mm -hmm. a really high score because I think the rest of the support is spectacular. Yeah, I gave it a 7, and that's just probably because I'm old and cranky, um, but that's what I gave it. I'm sticking with it. <laughs> All right, as Chal and I get to the end of this review and uh, give our final concluding thoughts, we always like to start by asking, would you pay whatever the price is for the game? And in this particular case, it is $25 for the starter box set, which gets you uh, the rules and some of the essential tokens and markers that you need. What are your thoughts on the price? Yeah, that's great. I mean, for, for what you're paying... The, the components that you get. And for those of you out there who've been watching, you know I am a serious cheap ass, yeah. okay? <laughs> yeah. But even I, I can't, like... Now, they, where they will get you, they will get you on the individual part. <laughs> that's where they're going to make their well, money. That's, that's where yeah. you belong to a club, so that different right. people can buy different planes and they all come together. Yeah, that's, that's true. Now, actually, speaking of different planes, you know, you can also find a ton of these on eBay. Yeah. There are other places you can go to kind of get secondhand planes. And our club has been playing this game so long that we played the predecessor to this, which mm. was called, do you remember Wings of War? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wings of War came out in 2004, and that was a co-production with Fantasy Flight Games, who eventually dropped the license, and that's how Ares Games picked up that game system, and, uh, you know, they rebranded it Wings of Glory. But there are very, very few differences mechanically between those games, and you can still use your old Wings of War planes in order good, to play good, this. Good, good. So my final score when you uh, do the weighted system comes out to a 77 out of 100, which is, uh, for our system, extremely high. I end up with a 78, and I'd agree. I don't have that many games I've scored quite that high. Uh, maybe um, Older Freedom. Well, I yeah. I scored that one pretty Yeah, it's a pretty good uh, system. But no, I mean, this, this is hard to knock. If you absolutely hate air-to-air uh, -air combat, of course you're not going to like it. If you absolutely hate everything about World War One, you're not going to like it. Otherwise... I don't care if you're beer and pretzels only or if you're really a serious uh, kind of player. Even a serious player would enjoy this. 
But yeah, we, well, we've been playing it in the club since 2004 because it's great in a club setting where you just need something quick. Mm -hmm. You need an extra spillover game or a last minute decision. Wings of Glory is there for that. And if you're trying to maybe get your family involved or get new players yeah. involved, this is a great introductory game for someone who's never played a war game to just get a little taste of yeah. what it might be like to fly a miniature around at the table. Yeah, and they don't have to worry about paint and stuff, which is like the real downside of miniatures war gaming. The quality of <laughs> almost all of the pre-painted planes that I've seen from them is really high. Mm -hmm. Really high. So, we're going to close out this review with a final reminder that Ares Games has not paid off Chow or myself <laughs> to say any of these nice things. We certainly would sell ourselves cheaply, but yeah. uh, we did not do so in this case. We are genuinely recommending that if you're interested in World War I air combat, I feel like this is a no-brainer. Is it really only 25 bucks? $25. Holy sh**.